Well, joy to the world. Uh, there's a the, the English poet, Edwin Brock, in one of his poems, he says, uh, he says, don't talk to me about snakes. They keep telling me about snakes. Then they said there was somebody else there, uh, someone called Satan. No first name, just Satan. And as if snakes and one name bastards weren't enough, they said all he did was give her an apple to eat. I don't understand any of it. What an introduction, right? Don't talk to me about snakes. Well, I'd like to talk to you about snakes today a little bit. Um, the serpent was the most subtle of all the wild beasts that the Lord God had made. And it asked the woman, did God really say, did he really say that you are not to touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you are not to eat from it? And Eve, the woman, answered the serpent, um, we may not eat from it nor touch it, lest we shall most surely die. And you know the rest of the story already. Uh, which tree do they eat from? The tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it was through the envy of the devil that sin entered into our world and with sin came death. Now having said all that by way of introduction, I want to speak about the resurrection. What did the early church preach about? Uh, what does St. Paul preach about? Um, well, he tells us here in, in uh, the letter to the Corinthians. He says, uh, Brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Gospel means good news. The gospel that you received and which you are firmly established because the gospel will save you only if you keep believing exactly what I preach to you. Believing anything else will not lead to anything. Come on, Paul, get on with it. What did you preach about? And he said, here it is. Well then, in the first place, I taught you what I had been taught myself, namely that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared first to Cephas, who was St. Peter, and secondly to the Twelve. Next, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the disciples. And last of all, he appeared to me too. It was as though I was born when nobody expected it, like a, an untimely birth. Now, basically, if you pushed me and said, what do you preach about, preach, uh, preacher? And uh, uh, if I summarize it myself, um, I, I preach... Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again in glory soon. He has, di he has died, that time passed, he has died, uh, Christ is risen and with us at this moment. Now the moment in which I am, I, I am speaking um, will not be the same moment when you are looking at this video. So I want you to know Christ is risen. Period. Has died, is risen, and will come again in glory soon. And when is soon? Bear in mind, in the mind of God, a thousand years is but a day, and a day is a thousand years. So... Uh, now, me preaching about Christ has died. Um, Christ has died. Past tense. Il tiempo passada. 
uh, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Like a sheep before his shearers, he was silent, not opening his mouth. And St. Thomas Aquinas um, was inspired by the greatest sermon ever preached. It was preached from the cross. So I'm always preaching Christ and him crucified. Now, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then my faith and your faith is useless. And so what does risen from the dead mean? Well, it means that, again, as you're looking at this video and I'm speaking this video this second, the risk Christ is risen, he's alive and he's in our midst. We're not allowed to see him in the glory of his second coming at this moment, but he is risen and with us at this moment. It is the risen Christ that gives life to all the sacraments of the church. Like you arrive, for instance, this week and you say, uh, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It is a month since my last confession. It is 55 years from my last confession. And here are my sins. And then you confess them and say what they are. And then Christ, risen from the dead, in the distressing disguise of the priest, absolves you. There's the risen Christ, present in our midst. I absolve you from all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, you go to Holy Mass, and the scriptures are read. The word of God is like a two-edged sword. It pierces between the marrow and the bone, uh, the soul and the spirit. And somehow, this is beyond my own understanding uh, in, in the uh, hopelessness of our preaching. The risen Christ is speaking to us. Your fathers at the time of Moses eat the manna in the wilderness, but they died nonetheless. Whoever eats the bread that I will give him will live forever. Again, the risen Christ in the distressing disguise of the priest, complete with accent and skin color and humanness and his own sins. The risen Christ, using the hands of the priest, does the same miracle he did at the Last Supper. Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. And then um, he will come again in glory soon. Now, the church teaches this, and I believe it. But I'm one of the, that I know of, I'm one of the few people that when I preach the second coming of Christ, I always say he will come again in glory soon. Like maybe today. So that's the gospel I preached. Has died, by dying he destroyed our death, is risen and with us at this moment, and will be with us all days, even to the end of the world. And he will come again in glory soon. Now you draw a distinction, obviously, when you say he comes again in glory soon. Um, you know, Christ comes to us in the distressing disguise of you, a little video watcher. And, and he comes to you in the distressing disguise of the priest, son of a preacher man. And he comes to us when the scriptures are opened. But he will come again in glory soon. Now watch Paul here and watch his preaching. And This goes back 2,000 years. He said, well then, in the first place I taught you what I had been taught myself. Somebody passed it on to Paul as I'm passing it on to you. Namely, that Christ has died for our sins. All through the Old Testament, uh, they slaughtered sheep and goats. You know, um, 
and supposedly uh, by slaughtering sheep and goats, our sins were forgiven. But the blood of sheep and goats take nothing away. And this Jesus, however, is the Lamb of God. So namely, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Then all the evidence, this is important, we pay little attention to it, that he appeared first to Peter and secondly to the twelve. Next he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. 500 of the brothers at the one time. Visualize a great crowd on a mountain. And he appeared to them. And he also was taken up from that same mountain. He ascended into heaven. And even when that happened in front of them, some, some remained unbelievers. But many, many believed in him. And they've passed on the message, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, down through the centuries. And now we live with it every day. And then he appeared to James and to all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me too, me, Paul. It was as though I was born when nobody expected it. It's almost like Paul said, I'm like a miscarriage, you know, but I was barely alive type of thing. He appeared to me. Now, the appearance to Paul is different. His full name at the time was Saul of Tarsus. Um, he obviously would have studied the Torah, the first five books of the Bible and the prophets and the Psalms. And, uh, and this Jesus was an imposter. And he took it upon himself to uh, uh, persecute and try to stamp out uh, all this talk of the resurrection and all this talk of Christ being the Messiah. So he was on his way one time from Jerusalem to Damascus to round up anybody who confessed the name of Jesus. And on the way to Damascus, he was struck down he had tend to put them in jail, all these people he caught or punished them or killed them in some way. Remember this Saul of Tarsus supervised the murder of St. Stephen, the first martyr from the time of Christ. And he was struck down and the voice of the risen Christ from heaven spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who are you, sir, that I am persecuting? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, look at this extraordinary dynamic here. Paul was actually persecuting men and women like you and I. And Jesus in glory in heaven, while he's with us on earth at the same time, uh, points out to him that by persecuting us, he was persecuting him. So the risen Christ identifies so much with us day by day that when we receive one another, we receive Christ. When we persecute one another, we persecute Christ. So that's my gospel. Um, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again in glory soon. And so um, when is soon? Well, I don't know, it's been 2,000 years since all these things happened. So what do you mean by soon? Well, what I mean by soon is today. Um, I expect the living Christ to come today, the, rest, the glorious Christ the judge of the living and the dead. And now you'll say to me, well, what happens if he doesn't come today about to your expectancy? What happens if he comes tomorrow? Well, tomorrow will be today.
when it arrives. So uh, I'd be telling you the same thing. He has died. Death has been destroyed. He is risen and with us at this moment. He will come again in glory soon to judge the living and the dead. Amen. Amen.